What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the New York State 2022 math test for grade 8, and I'll leave a link to a copy of this test in the description below. Now let's get started. Question 1, we want to know which graph represents a function that is increasing. So if I'm looking for an increasing function, I want a function that goes up. Okay, so I'm just looking for something that is going up as we move from left to right. So notice this one here is neither increasing nor decreasing. So this one here is out. Now, the problem with choice B is that this does not represent a function because notice here that we have something that if I were to draw a line going through this, this graph here would fail the vertical line test. Notice my vertical line hits this vertical line at infinite locations like this. So this one here, we cannot count as a function of X. So we're gonna cross out choice B. And now if we look at choice C, this one goes down. So this would be a decreasing function. So C is out. So just by pro process of elimination, it has to be choice D. But if we look here, we could see that we have an increasing function because as we move from left to right, the graph of the line is going up. So choice D is our answer. Question two, we wanna know what is the solution to the equation below? So for this question here, we could start by using the distributive property. So we could send this 2.5 through the parentheses like this, and now we just multiply. We're gonna have 2.5 times x, and then we have plus 2.5 times five. Now, the math that I'm doing in my head is I'm imagining that I'm doing 25 times five instead. So we can use a basic calculator for this, but I'll just show the math that I'm doing in my head. I'm doing 25 times five is 125, but notice that we have one decimal here. So if I have 2.5 times five, I just say 12.5, okay? So that's how I'm getting this value over here. And then we have this is equal to, we have 7.5 times X, and we have minus 0 0.5. So now from this stage here, we wanna get the X's on one side of the equal sign. So notice we have an X on the left side, and we have an X term on the right side. So I would do minus 2.5 X on both sides, and that's gonna move the X terms to the right side. Now we could have done minus 7.5 X on both sides, but notice that 7.5 is greater than 2.5. So when we subtract here, we're gonna have all positives. So now I have 12.5, that's all that's left on the left side, is equal to, and for this, if I'm doing this without a calculator, I'm imagining that I'm doing 75 minus 25 is 50. And now I just put a decimal in the middle of everything. So 7.5 minus 2.5 is just 5.0, or I could just say 5x, and we have minus 0.5. So now we'll add the 0.5 to both sides to get this x term by itself. So we do plus 0.5, and now we've got 13 equals, and we have 5x. Okay, we're just doing 12 and a half plus a half is 13. And now we just divide both sides by five. And now for this, we're gonna have x equals, and we could type this in a calculator, or some more mental math. I have 13 divided by five is two. There's a remainder of three, because five times two is 10, so we're three away from 13 and we divided by five, so three-fifths. I could just think of here a few different ways. If I do times two, top and bottom, it's gonna give us six over 10, and six-tenths is equal to, we're gonna have 2.6. Okay, so that's where 2.6 is coming from, and this is gonna match up with choice A. Question three, we have two boxes of cereal in the shape of a rectangular prism, and they're both on a shelf, and we have the dimensions of each box of cereal are listed below. So box A has a height of 25 centimeters, a length of 20 centimeters, and a width of nine centimeters. And then we have box B has a height of 25 centimeters, a length of 19 centimeters, and a width of six centimeters. And we wanna know what is the difference in volume in cubic centimeters between the two boxes of cereal? Well, for one, we have to know that the volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. Okay, so in this situation here, what I would do is say the volume of box A, which I'll indicate with the A in this, we call this a subscript. So we have V with a little subscript A. So the volume of box A, I could say is equal to, I'm gonna do the length times the width times the height. So I'm doing length is 20 centimeters. And I'll just write the numbers here. The units at the end are cubic centimeters, which is centimeters to the third power. Okay, so that's, going to be the units, but this is multiple choice and the answer key, we're just worried about the numerical stuff here. So I have 20 
times the width is nine centimeters and the height is 25 centimeters. Okay, if I did wanna write units at the end, it would be cubic centimeters. And the reason being I'm doing centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, and that makes centimeters to the third power. Okay, so that's why we get cubic centimeters here because volume is three dimensions. So now this, I just have to work out, but I'll save this all for, you know, one, I'll do this all at once on the calculator. So we'll write out the volume of serial box B. We're doing length times the width of the serial box is six centimeters. And then the height of the, or the height of box B is 25 centimeters. Okay. And the units would be cubic centimeters. So now we just have to multiply these pairs of, or these sets of numbers together. So first we'll do 20 and we have times nine times 25. Now for this test, you are not allowed to use a fancy graphing calculator, but I'm just gonna use this calculator to do basic stuff. So this is the volume of the first box. And now for the second box, we're gonna have 19 times six times 25. And our goal here is to find the difference in the volumes. Notice that 4,500 shows up. Okay, so this is just a very tempting answer choice, but we actually have to subtract these two numbers. We want the difference. So I'm doing the bigger volume minus the smaller volume. And this is all the information we need. So if we just summarize everything, the volume of box A, we're saying is 4,500 cubic centimeters. And then the volume of box B, after we did this product in the calculator, we have 2,850 cubic centimeters. And then the difference just means how far away are these two from each other? So we just subtract, we do 4,500 minus 2,850. And this we just did in the calculator gave us 1,650. Okay, so the difference in volume, and we'll just make that neater. So we have 16, we'll just erase here to make this look a little bit nicer. So we have 1,650. So 1,650 cubic centimeters, the answer here is gonna be choice A. Question four, which equation represents the line shown on the coordinate plane below? And for this one, I really like this formula, y equals mx plus b. This is the slope intercept form of a line. And m represents the slope of the line. That's the coefficient or the number in front of x. And b represents the y intercept of the line. Now, since we have a graph here, the slope we could think of as rise over run. So when we want to calculate the slope, we could just count the rise over the run. And the y intercept is just where the line crosses the y-axis. So notice here that the line is crossing the y-axis at four. So our b value here is equal to four, which is not actually going to help us because notice all of the answer choices end with plus four. So the most important detail here is going to be to find the slope. So notice the well-defined points are the ones that were bolded for us. So I want to count the rise over the run to get from here to here. So I'm going to rise one, two, three, four, five. So our slope, we're rising five, we're going up five. And then from here, we're gonna go over one, two. Okay, so we're going up five units and we're going over two units. So our slope should be five over two, which tells us the equation of our line, if we plug in for M and B, we're gonna have Y equals five over two times X and then plus four. Okay, and this is gonna match up with choice D. Now, let's just say you don't feel like counting the rise over the run, you can use this formula here, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And you could pick any two points on this line and plug them into this formula. The slope of a line does not change. So let's say here I plug in, this is the point we're going over two and then we're going up nine. So this is the point with coordinates two, nine. And this is the point with coordinates zero, four. If I were to plug into the slope formula, I could think of this as my x1, y1. And this I could call my x2, y2. And I would have, we would have nine minus four. See, we're doing y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 is zero here. So then nine minus four is five. And then we're dividing by two minus zero. See how we get the same exact slope. Okay, but that depends on the situation, which one you would rather use. But when you have a graph, the rise over run method is very effective. But either way, choice D is our answer. Question five, we have two intersecting lines L and T are shown in the diagram below. Then we have if Y equals 115, what is the value of X? So the first thing we could do is just replace Y with 115. So I'm gonna write a 115 here. And once again, we're just substituting for Y. And the next thing we should know is that when you have intersecting lines, 
the vertical angles that are formed are equal in measure. And the vertical angles are the ones that are directly across from each other. So I could say that, let's say this angle over here is equal in measure to this angle over here. And I could also say that this angle over here, the 115 degree angle, is going to be equal to this angle over here, the 2x minus 15 degree angle. Okay, so these two things here are equal to each other. So I'm going to set up this equation over here. I'm going to do 2x minus 15 is equal to, and then we have 115. And now all I have to do from here is solve for x. So I'm going to do plus 15 on both sides. And now minus 15 plus 15 cancels. You have 2x equals 115 plus 15 is going to give you 130. And then to solve for x, just divide both sides by 2. And if we type this in a calculator or just do the division ourselves, 130 divided by 2 is 65. Okay, so we're going to get 65 is the value of x. Now, one thing to be on the lookout for, sometimes students will look at two angles in a diagram like this, and they'll say, oh, straight lines make 180 degrees. And they'll say something like this, 2x minus 15 plus 115 equals 180. And watch what happens if we do this. We're going to have 2x. If we do negative 15 plus 115, we're going to get 100. And this is equal to 180. And then subtract 100 on both sides. And you're going to get 2x on the left side after 100 minus 100 cancels equals 180 minus 100 is 80. And now divide both sides by 2. And you're going to have x equals 40. But be careful. Choice A is a very dangerous bear trap. All right. This would be correct if the 115 degree angle was over here instead. Then you could see we would have this angle and this angle forming a straight line, but that is not the case. Okay, so we cannot do this in this situation here, but just know that there will be an answer choice waiting for you. If you set up the wrong equation, we need to, we needed to set these two angles equal to each other instead. So choice C is our answer. Question six, we have triangle P undergoes a sequence of transformations resulting in triangle Q. Which sequence of transformations could be used to show that triangle Q is similar, but not congruent to triangle P? So for this question here, what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about the transformation of a dilation. Okay, so what a dilation actually is, is if I have my center of dilation, let's say over here, and then I have some triangle, let's say I call this one over here, triangle P. Okay, so here's triangle P. And now let's say I dilate by a scale factor of two. So a scale factor of two just means whatever the distance is from, let's say this point on the triangle to my center, I'm just gonna double that distance and go out twice as long. So I'm just kind of eyeballing this here, but we'll say that in the new triangle that we're gonna go out this far from the center. And now if I'm going, so I probably drew this a little bit too big, but we'll get the idea across using this. So if I were to go from, let's say, let me draw that a little bit neater. If we're gonna go from the center to let's say this point up here at the top, then I'm gonna draw my dotted line from the center like this, and I'm gonna double that distance. I'm gonna land like somewhere over here. And now from this point to this point, I'm gonna draw my dotted line, and I'm going to double this distance over here. And you could see that when I draw this new triangle in, that this new triangle is going to be the same shape but just a different size from the original triangle, okay? So these two triangles here, if I call this one the original triangle, is triangle P, I'll just write it clearer, and that the new triangle here, triangle Q, is over here. You could see that these two triangles here are similar, but they are not congruent because triangle Q is bigger than triangle P. So I automatically just look for dilation, and I could see that this is choice D. Question seven, we have a scatter plot shown below, and we want to know which statement best explains why these data can or cannot be modeled using a line of best fit. So the goal here is to use a line of best fit. But if we look at this data over here, if I attempt to draw a line through this set over here like this, notice that it's going to miss these points over here. If I were to draw the line like this, let's say I target this bottom cluster of points, it's going to miss these points completely. So a line is not going to be appropriate here. Now, why is the line not appropriate? So we could get rid of choices C and D that is saying a line would be appropriate. And this is gonna be because the points follow a non-linear pattern, okay? A single line is not going to capture this here. So that's why we can't just go ahead 
and use a line of best fit. You could see what would be a best fit is if I drew a curve kind of like this here, okay? If I were to change direction as I'm dropping down like this, then I would have a curve of best fit, but a line is not going to be appropriate. So choice B is our answer. Choice A is no good because we can have a line of best fit that has a negative slope. We can have a line dropping down. So choice A is a tempting answer, but B is the one that best explains why uh, these data can not be modeled using a line of best fit. Question eight, what is the solution, if any, to the equation given here? And we could have either a single solution, we could have no solutions, or we could have infinite number of solutions. So for this one, I would start by distributing the three in front of the parentheses like this. So we're gonna have three times X is three X, and we're gonna have three times negative two is negative six. And now here we have to be careful. Don't do three times four because the plus four is outside of the parentheses. So we're just gonna write plus four like this. And now we have three X and we have plus six. So from here, what we wanna do is we wanna combine these like terms. We're gonna have three X and we have negative six plus four is negative two. And now this is equal to three X plus six. So now from here, our goal is to solve for X. And I could tell right from this step that we're gonna have no solution because the X terms on both sides have the same coefficient. It's a three X and a three X. So when we do minus three X on both sides, all of the X terms are going to disappear. And what we're gonna be left with is negative two is equal to six. But this is never true, okay? This is never true. And what this means, if you get a statement that is ridiculous, like negative two equals six, that means the original equation has no solution, okay? So there is no solution for X, and that's why it is choice C. Now, one thing I wanna point out is, let's say somebody had made the mistake of doing three X minus six, but then they actually distributed the three to the four over here and got plus 12. And now this is equal to three X plus six. In a situation like this, you'd have negative six plus 12 is positive six. And now you have three X plus six equals three X plus six. And in this situation here, if I solve for X or I try to move all my X's to one side, notice here what I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have six is equal to six. And this is always true, okay? This is always true. And it doesn't matter which value of X we plug in, because at the end, the X's disappear completely and we're left with something that is always true. <laughs> but we have to be careful here. This would be a very, very dangerous bear trap. And of course, if you make one misstep, the multiplication is designed in such a way that if you make one misstep like this, there is going to be an answer choice waiting for you, okay? So you just have to make sure that you are very careful here. This is not the way to go, okay? We would not distribute all the way to the four. We would have to stop at the end of the parentheses. So choice C is our answer. Question 14, which expression is equivalent to this product here? And for this question, it really helps to know these exponent properties. When we have A to the B times A to the C, that is we're multiplying two exponent terms that have the same base. We could just add the exponents like this. We could write A to the B plus C. And another thing we have to know is if I have something like, let's say A to the negative B power, I could rewrite this as one over A to the positive B power. Okay, so this is the, or these are the two rules that I wanna use here. So first, when we multiply these two terms, we're gonna have 15, and our new exponent, we're gonna have three plus negative seven. Okay, so I'm just using this first property here. I'm adding the exponents together. And if I work this out, I'm gonna have 15 to the power negative four, because three plus negative seven is negative four. And now I'm gonna use this second property. I could rewrite 15 to the negative fourth as one over 15 to the positive four like this. Okay, so I'm just using these two properties here, and this is gonna match up with choice C. Question 15, we have Alex opened a savings account with an initial deposit of $50, and each month he deposits the same amount of money, and he uses this equation here to determine T, the total amount of money in his savings account in M months. And we wanna know what is the unit rate, and what is the meaning of the unit rate? So for this question here, the first thing that's coming to mind is the equation of a line but we need to interpret the equation of a line in the context of a word problem. So if I write out y equals mx plus b, if I were interested in graphing a line, m represents the slope and b represents the y-intercept. But in word problems, m, I like to think of as the rate of change, 
Okay, so this is the rate of change of a line. And B, in the context of word problems, is the fixed amount, I could say the initial amount. Okay, so this is the amount here that's not changing depending on whatever the unit of time is. In this case, M represents months. Okay, so the initial amount. Now, what's a little bit annoying here is that they didn't use Y equals MX plus B. Instead of Y, they used T. And instead of X, they used M. So we just have to be very careful when we identify each piece. B, the B term is the initial amount. And in this case here, the B term is the constant term that's all by itself. So 50, if we want to define it in the context of the question, that's the initial deposit, which they even tell us. Alex opened a savings account with an initial deposit of $50. So the 50 is the initial amount, okay? So that is the initial amount. And they're asking for what is the unit rate? So the 50 is not the unit rate. That's the initial amount. So we have to you know, get rid of this. The unit rate is basically the rate of change of the bank account here, the savings account. And they told us here that each month he deposits the same amount of money, okay? And the rate of change goes in front of the variable. So if we wanna look for the rate of change, that's the coefficient of M. And if we look here, the coefficient of M is 25. That is gonna represent our unit rate, which is how much money that Alex deposits each month. So that's gonna match up with choice A. The reason why choice C is no good, 25 is not the amount of money that Alex initially deposited, okay? That would be the $50 and that is not the rate that would represent the initial amount, okay? So A, 25, the amount of money that Alex deposits each month, that is our answer. Question 16, we have to solve this equation here. And for this question, we have to be skilled with fractions. So what we're gonna do first is distribute this negative one third all the way through the parentheses. And one thing to be mindful of is when you multiply something like negative one third by six, so I'm gonna do negative one third times six. In this situation here, there's a few ways I could handle this. One way would be to just multiply straight across. I could call this six over one, and I could do negative one times six is negative six, over, I have three times one is three, and negative six divided by three is negative two. Now, another way to do this, I could take negative one third and multiply by six, and I could cross cancel. I could do six divided by three right away is two, and negative one times two is also negative two. So either way here is going to work. So when I do negative one third times six y, negative one third times six, we just saw is negative two, but that's gonna give us negative two times y, and now I have a negative times a positive is a negative, and same idea, I'm doing negative one third times six, but we already showed that work, is minus two. And now plus 21 is outside of the parentheses, so we're not gonna distribute this far, and this is equal to three y, right? So now we'll just section this off so that we know not to you know, write you know, these terms here next to each other, and we have negative two y, and then we have negative two plus 21. So what we have here, I'm gonna combine like terms. I have negative two plus 21 is gonna give us 19, positive 19. Just think of this as 21 minus two is 19. And now I have negative two y, and then this is all equal to three y. So all we did was just combine these two like terms here, and that brought us to this step here. So now I wanna get all my y terms on one side. So I'm gonna do plus two y on both sides. That way I have all the y terms on one side and I have the constant 19 on its own. So now negative two y plus two y cancels. I have 19 equals five y, cause I'm doing three y plus two y. These are like terms, so I just add three plus two. And now I just divide both sides by five. And this is gonna give us, we're gonna have y equals, and this works out to 19 over five and that matches up with choice A. Question 19, we have the graph of a function is shown on the coordinate plane below, and we wanna know between which two values of x is the function nonlinear and increasing. So for this, we just have to know how to think about this in a different way. So if we're looking for where the function is nonlinear, we wanna look for the part of the graph that is not a straight line, okay? So notice here that this first part of the graph, if I call this like, let's say section one, section two, section three, and section four, that the first section of the graph is linear. So I want the part that's nonlinear. So this part of the graph is out. Also, this third portion of the graph here, you could see is linear because it's in the shape here of a straight line. So I could cross off section three. 
And now that leaves us with the second section and the fourth section. But I'm also looking for where is the function increasing, which means where is the graph going up? So if I look at the two remaining sections, I could see that in section two, my graph is going up and it's definitely not a straight line here. The problem with section four is that it's nonlinear, but it's decreasing. It's not nonlinear and increasing. We have something here that's nonlinear and decreasing. So that is why section four is out. So now we just have to go down to the answer choices here. And they're asking us between which two values of X is this happening? So if I look here, now I'm just going to get rid of all this extra stuff here. So we'll just clear this out. So that way we could see. So I'll just move that over. And notice that the highlighted portion of the graph starts when X is equal to negative three and the highlighted portion here stops when X is equal to one. So we're using the X values here to say where this is happening. And this is happening between X equals negative three and X equals positive one. So choice B is our answer. Question 23, we have the dimensions of a cone are shown in the figure below. And we want to know what is the approximate volume in cubic centimeters of the cone? So for this question here, we have to know the formula volume equals one third, and then we have pi r squared h, okay? This is the formula for the volume of a cone. And this formula you could actually find on the reference page. So you don't need to memorize this, but you have to know that this is the formula that you want to use. So from here, what we're going to do is identify the dimensions. We have the height of the cone. That's the distance from this circle all the way here at the bottom to this point here of the cone. So we're going to say the height is equal to 11 centimeters. And now the radius of the cone, we look at the biggest circle in the cone and we're measuring the distance from the center all the way to one end here like this. And that distance is six centimeters. So that's the radius of the cone. If they had given us, let's say the diameter of the cone instead, let's say they told us that this entire distance was six, we'd have to make sure to divide it by two. But here they're telling us the radius. So that allows us to just plug in. And for this part here, I'm not going to plug the units into the equation. We could just say that the volume at the end is measured in cubic centimeters. So now we have one third times pi and we have R squared. So I'm doing six to the second power and the height is 11. Okay, so we're just gonna work this out here. So if we simplify and we'll worry about the pi at the end, we're gonna have one third times pi and then we have six times six is 36. So I'm just multiplying, we have times 36 and then times 11. Now, the math that makes the most sense to do here is doing 36 times a third. That's the same thing as doing 36 divided by three is 12. Okay, and then 12 times 11, if we just have our you know times tables memorized here, 12 times 11 is 132. So, so far I have the volume equals 12 times 11 is 132. And now I tack on the pi here. Okay, so this brings us to this step here. Now from here, what I'm thinking of, we could use approximation techniques. Just know that pi is roughly, we have 3.1415, okay? And then this just keeps going on like this. And they want the approximate volume. So I don't have to write a ton of digits after the decimal. You know, pi does go on forever. I only need a few, but at this point, I think the answer is somewhat obvious, okay? If you look here, what I'm thinking, if we use approximation methods, like let's say I did 130, something really close to 132, and I multiplied by three, this would give me 390, okay? And since pi is a little bit more than this, see how 415 is really close to 390. The problem with 622 would be, that would be the result of doing, let's say 130 if I did times four. This would bring me to, if I work this out, to 520. So you see how I'm not even, you know, I'm pretty far away still from choice C. And that would be if I rounded pi incorrectly all the way up to four. I'd still have to multiply by more than that. So that's how I know without doing any serious long multiplication that 415 is the most reasonable. If I really wanted to be certain here though, what I could do is I could just multiply by 3.1415, let's say, okay? I could multiply that far out or I could just do 314 like this times 132. And we should see that when I get to the end, I'll put the decimal back here and I'll put two places at the end, but multiplying these two out will give us something close to this. So let's say I did work this out. Two times four is eight, two times one, two times three is six. I put a placeholder, three times four is 12, carry the one. 
And then we have three times one is three plus one is four. And if three times three is nine. Now I put two placeholders and now I'm multiplying by one. So this row shouldn't be too bad. And now I'm just gonna add everything up. So I have eight, two plus two is four. This will make 14, carry the one. I get 11 and then I get this here. So notice when I put my two decimal places here, I'm gonna pay two decimal places back down here. I get 414.48. And that's because I did a pretty bad job of rounding pi down to just two decimal places. But what you could see here is that if I were to go out more and just bump the value of pi up a little bit by adding in this one five, you know, and the next few digits, that would just get me closer and closer and closer to 415. So choice B is our answer. Now, one more thing to add here before we move on. Let's say we want to use the calculator to evaluate this product. We can just do one third and then we have pi would be second and then I have this up arrow here. And if you're using a different calculator, just look for the part where there's a pi. For the Texas Instrument calculators, it's usually just second and then one of the buttons over here. And then after the pi, we have six squared. So I'm gonna put parentheses six, close the parentheses, square it, and then I have times 11. And if I type it in like this, notice that I get something very, 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 very close to 415. So once again, I can use the calculator for this and it's much faster. I just thought it'd be cool to review some of these approximation techniques. Question 24, a triangle with side lengths A, B, and C is shown below. And we wanna know which statement about the side lengths must be true. So one thing that you should know about triangles is the triangle inequality theorem. Okay, so we have the triangle inequality theorem. And what this theorem states is that the sum of any two sides of a triangle. So the triangle inequality theorem says that the sum of any two sides of a triangle has to be greater than the third side. So the only answer choice I see here that has a greater than is choice A. So this is the one I wanna investigate, that the sum of these two sides of A and B, so A plus B, would have to be greater than the third side C. Okay, so right away, if you just know your theorems here, this is the one that has to be true. Now, looking at the remaining answer choices, they all have less thans, but like we could see why these don't necessarily have to be true. And for this one, I have B plus C has to be less than A. Well, let's say for this question here, I just make this, let's say three, four, five, which just happens to represent the three sides of a right triangle, which I could check if I use the Pythagorean theorem, but for this question here, you know, I'm not gonna go that far, but you could even see if I did B plus C, if I did five plus four, that's equal to nine, and that is not less than three, okay? So that's why choice B is out. This statement here is not true. If I did A plus B, if I did three plus five, that would give me eight, that is not less than four, okay? So this one is out. If I did A plus C, if I did three plus four, three plus four would give us seven, and seven is not less than then five. So this one here is not necessarily true either. Okay. So just by making up a triangle where you know the numbers work, you can rule out the other answer choices if let's say you forget the triangle inequality theorem. But this theorem is very helpful to know. Once again, the sum of any two sides of a triangle have to be greater than the third side. Choice A is our answer. Question 25, we have a line graphed on the coordinate plane shown below, and we want to know what is the equation of the line? So for this question, it really helps to know this formula here, y equals mx plus b. And just know that m is the slope of the line, okay? That tells us the rise over the run. And then what we have after this is the b value is our y-intercept, okay? So we have the slope and we have the y-intercept and that is our b value. So when I'm coming up with an equation from a graph, the B value is the easiest thing to spot. That's where the line crosses the Y axis. So here we have a B value of eight. And now when I wanna find my slope, what I could do is I can use this formula here, the Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1 formula, or I could just count the rise over the run. So to get from here to here, I'm gonna go, and be careful here, don't go one, two, three, four. Notice that we're skip counting by two. So I'm going down, I'm going down two, four, six, eight. So my slope, I'm going, we're going down eight. So that's a rise of negative eight. And then I'm going over two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay, and if we simplify this, divide the top and bottom by two. So I divide the top by two and I divide the bottom by two. That's gonna simplify to negative four over five. 
So here is my slope and here is my y intercept. So these are the significant values that I need. And then I just plug into the formula. I have y equals m is negative 4 fifths. I tack on the x and my b value is positive 8. So now we just scan the answer choices and this is going to match up with choice A. Question 26, we have there are two mechanics who work on cars. And for each mechanic, the relationship between X, the number of hours worked, and Y, the total cost in dollars is described below. So the first bullet point here, we have the equation Y equals 36X represents the total cost charged by mechanic A for the number of hours worked. So what I'm noticing here, Y equals 36X. Notice this is in the form of Y equals MX plus B. So the coefficient of X here is our rate of change. Okay, and that tells us how much the mechanic charges per hour. Okay, so this is the mechanic A's rate per hour. So this is how much money that the mechanic charges, $36 per hour. Okay, so this is in the context of the question. And then we have the graph shown below represents the total cost charge by mechanic B for the number of hours worked. So for this one, what's I guess a little bit more challenging is that to identify the rate, we actually have to find the slope of this line. So here, let's say we look at this point here at zero, zero. What we could do is we could find the slope of this line by using the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, so this is the formula that we're gonna use. And here, zero, zero represents x1, y1. And our second point on this line is here. That's the point 288. Okay, so now we just plug in and we're gonna have 88 minus zero. So we're doing y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So the slope here, if I do 88 divided by two is equal to 44. So what this tells us is that mechanic B, if we talk about mechanic B's rate, mechanic B charges $44 per hour. So now as we look at the answer choices here, we could see that the difference in the rates, if I do 44 minus 36, I take the bigger, the bigger number and then I subtract the smaller number, this works out to eight, okay? So what this tells us is that mechanic B charges $8 more per hour than mechanic A, okay? Because once again, the graph represented the graph for mechanic B's charges, okay? And the slope of this line was 44. So mechanic B charges more by $8 per hour. Now, if we look at the other answer choices here, the reason why these are no good is that someone is just looking at this and saying, oh, there's a 36 here and an 88 here. And if I do 88 minus 36, this is gonna give me 52. But the problem with this way of thinking is that this person here is only considering the difference between these two numbers. They're not, they're not thinking about what these numbers actually mean. The 88 here represents that if the mechanic or if mechanic B works for two hours on your car, so for two hours of work, mechanic B is gonna charge $88, okay? So if you think about this, that's a rate of $44 per hour, all right? So that's the meaning of this 88. So just be careful with these kind of questions. Make sure you are really taking your time to understand what each number represents in the equation. But here, the rate of change is the coefficient of X, and in the context of the graph, that's the slope of the line. So choice B is our answer. So now we're moving on to the session two questions. And for question 34, we have Corey drinks water from a bottle during a bike ride. And the average amount of water in ounces in his water bottle can be represented by the equation. We have Y equals negative eight X plus 32, where Y is the amount of water remaining after X hours. And then we have based on the equation, what is the amount of water? So we wanna know what is the amount of water in ounces or what amount of water in ounces will remain in the bottle after Corey rides two and a half hours. So notice here that X represents the number of hours. So all we have to do here is plug in two and a half. So we could just do Y equals and we have negative eight. And just know that two and a half I could say is 2.5. So I could say negative eight times 2.5. And then I'm just gonna add 32 like this. Okay, so now we just work this out. We have y equals, and if I do negative eight times two and a half, that's just gonna give us, we're gonna have negative 20. So I have negative 20 plus 32. And now I worked out, I work out this sum here. I have negative 20 plus 32 is 12. Okay, just think of that as 32 minus 20 is 12. 
And that tells us that Corey has, remember, Y is the amount of water remaining and Y is measured in ounces. Okay, so we're going to say 12 ounces and this is going to match up with choice B. Question 35, we want to know which expression is equivalent to this expression here. And for this question, it really does help to know these rules. A to the B times A to the C is A to the B plus C. And then when we do division, if we have A to the B divided by A to the C, we have A to the B minus C. And then finally, we have this rule, A to the B to the power C is A to the B times C. And then I could also write, if we have A to the negative B, this is one over A to the B power. Okay, so these four properties here are very helpful to know. So here, four to the negative five times four to the eight if I simplify this, this is four to the negative five plus eight. And I just think of this as eight minus five is three. So I get four to the third power. And now just looking at these remaining answer choices, I could see that let's say B and D, they jump out of me right away because this rule, if I use this third rule here, I just have to multiply B times C. So I have four to the three times negative one, a positive times a negative is negative, And I have three times one is three. So four to the third does not equal four to the negative third. So B is out. We wanna know which expression is equivalent. So choice D is no good for the same reason. I have four to the power negative one times three is negative three. So choice D is also no good. So now it's between these two answer choices. And if I use the division property here, I can rewrite this as four to the power two minus negative one. So you see I'm doing the top exponent B minus the bottom exponent c. So I have to do two minus the bottom exponent is negative one. But when I have minus minus, if I subtract a negative, the operation changes to addition. This becomes two plus one. And that would just give us four to the third, which does match what we have here. So choice c is our answer. Choice a is no good because if I use that property of exponents again, the division property over here, I would have four to the power negative two minus the bottom exponent is negative one. And this becomes four to the power negative two plus one. And if I do negative two plus one, so I have, I'll just make this a little neater. Negative two plus one is negative one. So this would give us four to the negative first, which is not equivalent to four to the third. Choice C is our answer. Question 36, we have lines L and M are parallel and intersect transversal P as shown in the diagram below. And we wanna know what is the value of N? So for this question here, we're told that these two lines are parallel. So I'm going to write or just draw in here these two arrows to show that these two lines are parallel. And the result of this is that the alternate interior angles formed by these two parallel lines in this transversal here, we could say are equal in measure. Okay. And the way I look for alternate interior angles is I look for that Z shape. So notice here that if I look here, I have the Z shape. So the letter Z though, I know goes this way like this. But just imagine this is the backward Z. So I could have a Z going this way, or I could have the backward Z like this. And there are my alternate interior angles. I could also say that corresponding angles are equal in measure. So notice how 3n plus 16 is in this lower right corner. I could write 3n plus 16 over here like this. And now you could see that I have vertical angles. I have these two intersecting lines. And these angles here are vertical, and vertical angles are also equal in measure. So to solve for n, all I have to do now is set these two expressions equal to each other. I have 5n plus 4 equals 3n plus 16. And now I'm just going to solve by doing minus 3n on both sides. And from here, we're going to have 3n minus 3n canceling out. We're going to have 2n plus 4 is equal to 16. And now to solve for n, I'm going to do minus 4 on both sides to get the constant terms over to the right side. And we have the variable term on the left. And now we have 2n is equal to 12. And now finally, just divide both sides by 2. And you're going to get n is equal to 6. Okay, so that is the value of n. Now, one thing I would do to feel really safe here is plug in and check my answer. So I'm going to do 3 times 6. And then I'm going to add 16. Okay, so I'm plugging in n equals 6 over here first. So that's going to give us 18 plus 16. And that's going to give us 34. So that tells us we have a 34 degree angle here. And now if I plug in six over here, notice we get five times six plus four, and that's gonna give us 30 plus four, which is 34. So notice that we get two matching angles here as we should. So choice A is definitely correct.
Question 37, we have these two trapezoids on the coordinate plane, and we're told that these two trapezoids are congruent. And what we want to find here is the sequence of transformations that will map trapezoid RSTU onto trapezoid NMLK. So the fact that these two trapezoids are congruent tell us that the corresponding sides of both of these trapezoids are congruent, as well as the corresponding angles. So our goal here is to map this trapezoid, RSTU. So we're starting with this trapezoid here, and we want it to land onto the next trapezoid down here. Now, one thing I like to focus on is one of the letters. So let's say I focus on R. R is the first letter that shows up in this trapezoid. N is the first letter that shows up in the other trapezoid. So my goal is to map, let's say I want to do point R. I want it to land on point N. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to look through the answer choices and see if I were to reflect over the y-axis, see how that would send point R over here like this. I would go over one and then I'd have to go over another one. I could just count the spaces to the line of reflection and I have to go one space left. So I'm going to continue one space left through the line of reflection. And this would be reflecting R through the y-axis. So looking here that the remaining answer choices say then go one unit right or one unit down. But if I go one unit right, notice that R doesn't land on point N. And if I go one unit down, I'm still not landing on this point. So reflecting over the Y axis is not the first move. So next we could try reflecting over the X axis. And let's see, if we reflect over the X axis, I have to count one, two, three, four spaces. So I'm going to go down one, two, three, four spaces. And that lands me here. So that's reflecting over the X axis first. But then how do I get from this point to point N? I have to go to the left one unit, okay? So that's why our answer here is gonna be choice B. The problem with choice D is if I reflect over the X axis and then I go one unit up, you see how that's gonna put me over here? It's not gonna land me on point N like I need this to, okay? So choice B is definitely our answer. Question 38, which set of ordered pairs represents a function? So for this question, we have to think about how do we know if we have a function? And one thing we could look for is we have no repeating X values. Okay, so no repeating X values is one of the things we could look for. And for a question like this, this would actually help us find the answer right away. The next thing we could look for is that our graph passes the vertical line test. Okay, so the graph passes the vertical line test. So what I'm imagining in a situation like this is if I had a graph of, let's say something like this, like a nice parabola. This parabola passes the vertical line test. If I draw a vertical line at any location, it's only going to hit the graph at one spot. So that means that this parabola would be a function. Okay, so that's another way to interpret this. I could use the vertical line test or I could look for the repeating X values and cross off the answers that have repeating X values. Like let's say choice A, notice that negative 40 comma zero and then we have negative 40 comma 50 these or this set of ordered pairs would not represent a function. If I wanted to say a little bit more or see the connection between the no repeating X values and the vertical line test, if I were to plot those two points, and this is not drawn to scale, so this is let's say negative 40, zero, and then I have negative 40, and we'll say 50 is all the way up here. So these two points, if I plot both of them on the X, Y axis, and I drop down a vertical line like this, notice that my vertical line hits both of those points and I can't have that if I have a function of X, okay? So that tells us here that we don't have a function with the set of ordered pairs in choice A. Now, looking at choice B, notice that negative 30 is one of the repeating X values, and it actually shows up three times, okay? So choice B is out. We, can, we cannot have any repeating X values if we want a function of X. And now notice choice C, negative 40, and then we have positive 20, positive 60 are all different X values. So choice C is definitely our answer, but let's see why choice D is no good. Notice the X values repeat here. We have negative 50 showing up twice. So choice D is out, definitely choice C. Question 39, what value for the constant N will result in no solution for the equation shown below? So for a question like this, it really helps to know the concept of when a linear equation has no solution. So if I treat the left side and right side as two separate lines, what I'm thinking of is if I were to have a situation where I have two parallel lines, the two parallel lines will never intersect, so they'll never be equal to each other, okay? So for something like this, I'm just imagining two parallel lines, and I know that parallel lines have the same slope, okay? They have the same rate of change. They're never going to intersect, 
And when I'm thinking of the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, if we have the same slope, that means we have the same value of m in both of those lines. So looking at this question here, I could see that the slope of the line on the right side is 10. So what I'm thinking about here is which value of n, such that when I distribute it through this expression here, is going to give me a, a 10x, okay? So my goal on the left side is to make 10x. So I'm just thinking here, what is the mystery value outside the parentheses that when I distribute is gonna turn this 5x into a 10x? The mystery value would have to be a two. Okay, so if n is equal to 2, this would give us matching slopes on the left and right side. And let's see what happens. We could check our answer. So if we have 2 times 5x plus 7, let's see what this does with the resulting equation. Okay, so we're just going to replace n with 2 and see what happens. So 2 times 5x is 10x. And then we have 2 times 7 is going to give us 14. And this is equal to, we have 10x plus 12. And now from here, if I subtract 10x on both sides, notice that 10x on the left side and the right side is gonna cancel out completely. And this leaves us with a ridiculous statement, 14 is equal to 12. And that is never true, okay? So since it's never true, there is no value of x that will ever make this true. That tells us that we have no solution, okay? This equation here for when n is equal to two has no solution, so choice B is definitely our answer. Question 40, we have triangle QPR is graphed on the coordinate plane below. And then we have triangle QPR is dilated by a scale factor of one half with center of dilation at the origin, resulting in triangle Q prime, P prime, R prime. And we wanna know what are the coordinates of vertex R prime. And we have the answers underneath this. So for this question here, if you just wanna use a formula, what you could do is you could identify the coordinates of R and R is located at 10, 4. Okay, so I have 10, 4. And if I want to dilate this point 10, 4, and I am using a scale factor of 1 half, so I'm going to scale this by a scale factor of 1 half, and I'm using the origin as our center. So I'm going to call the origin point O. So the proper notation would be to say dilation center of dilation is at point O, and I'm using a scale factor of 1 half then what we would have to do here is just multiply the x and the y by a half. Okay, so I would do 10 times a half, and then I'd have comma 4 times a half. And if I simplify this, this is going to work out to, we have 10 times a half is 5, and 4 times a half is 2. Okay, so I can just scan the answer choices and look for the point 5, 2, and this would match up with choice B. Now, if you want the more conceptual approach here, the concept of what a dilation is when we have a center of dilation what we're doing is we're taking the distance from the center to the point we're interested in, and we're gonna multiply it by the scale factor. So if I have a scale factor of a half, what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking the distance from here to here, and I'm cutting it in half. So one way of finding this is if I go from here to here, I have to go up one, two, three, four. I'm going up four, and then I'm going over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm going up four over 10. So if I use a scale factor of one half, let's say I cut this distance in half, I'm gonna do up two to the right five. So I go to my center of dilation and I go up one, two, and I go over one, two, three, four, five, and that puts me here. And notice that it puts me at the location five comma two. And you can even see that this point is halfway from the center to this location over here at R. And I can use that idea to get the other points of the triangle, but they only wanted us to find the location of R prime, okay? So R prime, we could say, is located at 5, 2. And once again, this is going to match up with choice B. Question 41, a camper lights an oil lantern at 12 noon and lets it burn continuously. Once the lantern is lit, the lantern burns oil at a constant rate each hour. At 2 p.m., the amount of oil left in the lantern is 63 ounces. And at 5 p.m., the amount of oil left in the lantern is 61 and a half ounces. Based on the average rate of oil burning per hour, how much oil in ounces was in the lantern at 12 noon? So for this question, there's a whole lot going on, but my best advice here would be to organize all of your work. So we could say here we have at 2 p.m., there is 63 ounces of oil in the lantern. And then we look a few hours later at 5 p.m., there is 61 and a half ounces of oil remaining. 
Okay, so what's actually going on in this question is the oil in the oil lantern is burning. That's why the amount of oil is decreasing as time goes on. And what we could find here first is the average rate of oil burning per hour. So we have to just calculate here how much oil was burned to get us from 63 ounces to 61 and a half ounces. We could just do the subtraction. We could do 63.0 minus 61.5. And for this section, you get a calculator, so you can just type this in. And if you do the subtraction here, you're gonna get 1.5. Okay, so there was 1.5 ounces of oil. So 1.5 ounces of oil was burned. So that is what happened in this time frame here. And now we just have to calculate how much time goes by from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., that is three hours, okay? So three hours goes by. For this, you could just do five minus two, and that tells you, once again, three hours goes by. So here, the average rate, we're comparing the rate of change here, or we're looking at the rate of change here of how much oil is burned per hour. So the average rate, I could just say, is 1.5 ounces over three hours, okay? so. 1.5 ounces per three hours. And this simplifies, if I do 1.5 divided by three, this is gonna to simplify to 0 0.5. So the unit rate is gonna be 0 0.5 ounces per hour. But now the actual question is, how much oil was in the lantern at 12 noon? Okay, so at 12 noon, or I could say at 12 p.m., we could take the amount of oil that is in the lantern at 2 p.m., there were 63 ounces of oil in the lantern at 2 p.m., and we could do 63 ounces plus 12 p.m. was two hours before 2 p.m. So that's plus two hours times the rate is 0 0.5 ounces per hour. Okay, and I like to include the units because you could see here that hours over hours cancels. And now if we simplify this, we're going to have 63 plus... So we have 63 ounces plus 2 times 0 0.5 is 1. So I have plus 1 ounce. So that tells us that at 12 noon, there were 64 ounces of oil in the lantern. And if you just want to check this, just think about it. If it's 12 p.m., one hour goes by, there's going to be 63 and a half ounces of oil left because we're burning 0 0.5 ounces per hour. And then another hour goes by and we go from 63.5 right to 63. So we could just record our answer. There are 64 ounces of oil in the lantern at 12 p.m. Question 42, we have figure M and its congruent image figure N are graphed on the coordinate plane below. And we have to describe a sequence of transformations that will take figure M onto its congruent image figure N. And we have to explain our answer. So for questions like this, I really advise that you think about which figure are you starting from and which one are you trying to land at. So figure M is the one we're starting at. We want to take figure M and we want it to land onto its congruent image, figure N. So this we would call the pre-image. And now the image is figure N, okay? So this is where we want to land. And I recommend that you take a moment to think about this because sometimes students will start with the wrong figure and they'll try to land on the other figure, okay? So the sequence of transformations will not necessarily bring figure N onto figure M, okay? So whatever the steps it takes to get this one to this one is not going to work necessarily to bring us from this figure back. So from here, what we want to do is we could focus on a single point that we want to match up. So I would take this point here. This point is where the pentagon, so this is not a regular pentagon, but it is a pentagon. It has five sides. And I want to think about how do I get this point here over to this point here? And I'm choosing those two points because it's very obvious that these two points are corresponding, okay? These are in the same relative location in both of these pentagons. So to get from here to here, what I noticed is we could rotate this entire figure around the origin, and I could go clockwise or I could go counterclockwise, and I could go 180 degrees, okay? If I go 180 degrees, that's gonna bring me over here like this. Coordinates of this point here this is the point negative one, one. If you know your rules for rotations, rotating 180 degrees is going to send us to the point one, negative one. And the way that you rotate 180 degrees is you just change the signs of the X and the Y coordinate. Another thing you could do is you could just take your paper 
and flip it upside down. And if you flip your paper upside down, this figure M, this point here at negative one, one is going to land in quadrant four. Okay. So if you spin your paper 180 degrees, it's going to land here. But now notice that this point didn't land on this point. So the first thing we're going to do is rotate 180 degrees and I have to specify a direction and a center. So I'm rotating 180 degrees. Let's say I go counterclockwise about the origin and then I'm going to translate. I'm going to go one, two, three units to the right and then I'm going to go three units down and that's going to send this point here over to this point here. Now, one thing we could do here just to be safe is I could take another point like this one, and this is the point we would have the coordinates negative one, three. And if I rotate this point 180 degrees counterclockwise about the origin, that would send us to the location one, negative three over here. And then I could see if I go one, two, three units right, and then three units down, notice that I land exactly on this point here. So this sequence of transformations, notice that it mapped a second point to the point that we need it to. And just know if I do this for the remaining three points, it's going to give me the other three points of figure N, the image of figure M. Question 43, in the figure shown below, we have line AC is parallel to line DE with transversal BF. So we have that these two lines here are parallel. So I'll just mark them with these pink arrows here. And now what we wanna do is we wanna determine the values of X and Y. So for this question here, there's a few ideas that we have to know, but when we have parallel lines cut by a transversal, one thing we could say is that corresponding angles are equal in measure. So if I have that this angle here in the top left corner is 3y plus 28, we could also say that this angle over here in the top left corner of this section of four angles, I could also name this as 3y plus 28, okay? So the measure here would be 3y plus 28 degrees. And now what I could say is I could say that these two angles here, notice that this angle here that I wrote in pink and this angle Y, these two angles form a straight line. So now we could say 3Y plus 28 and then plus Y is equal to 180, okay? Because if you have two angles forming a straight line, they form a linear pair, they make 180 degrees. So now my goal here is to solve for Y. So now I just have to work out this equation. So we have 3y plus y. So we're just going to combine like terms here. And we're going to have 4y and we have plus 28 is equal to 180. And now we just do the subtraction here. We're going to do minus 28 on both sides. And from here, 28 minus 28 cancels. And we have 4y is equal to. And if I do 180 minus 28, we could use a calculator for this. But if you want to do it in your head, to 180 minus 20 is 160, and 160 minus 8 is 152. And now we just divide both sides by 4, and this is going to tell us the value of y. The value of y here we could say is equal to, and I'll just write it over here, we have y is equal to. So y equals, and now we just do the division. So we use a calculator, or we could say 4 goes into 15 three times with the remainder of 3, and then 4 goes into 32 eight times. So y is equal to 38. Okay. So we have the value of y, but now to find the value of x, what we could do is we could plug back into this expression here. So we could say that three times y, so three times 38 plus 28. Okay. And we have this many degrees. So this is the measure of one of our angles here. So we have the measure of this angle here. So we'll just work this out. We have three times 38. And if we work that out, we're going to have 114 and then plus 28. Okay. And now we just simplify this sum here works out to, we're going to have 142. Okay. So this works out to 142. So this tells us that the measure of the angle here, this is a 142 degree angle. So I could say that this angle is 142 and I could say that this angle is 142. Now I chose to plug into this expression just to check that this value of y does in fact work out for us, okay? And the way I would know that this is definitely good is if I take y is equal to 38, so we have this angle here is a 38 degree angle, what I could do to check is I could do 142 plus 38, and notice that this works out to 180. So this makes me feel just extremely confident in our work so far 
that all these numbers are checking out. But now let's think about what is the value of X? Well, once I know that this angle here is 142 degrees, notice that X and this angle are vertical angles here, okay? So X degrees and 142 degrees, these intersecting lines here are giving us vertical angles. So I could say that X is just equal to 142. Okay, so we have y is equal to 38, x is equal to 142. Now, a small detail here, notice that it says y degrees. So when we are solving for x and y, we're only writing the number, we're not writing the degree with it, okay? Because they attached the degree symbol next to the expression here, and then next to the x and next to the y. So now we're just ready to record our answers. x is equal to 142, and we have y is equal to 38. Question 44, we have the steps a student took to solve an equation are shown below, and we wanna know what error did the student make and what is the correct value of x? Well, if we're looking for the correct value of x here, what we could do is we could solve this equation ourselves, find the correct value of x, and then that'll tell us where the student went wrong. So we'll just go step by step. So first, what we could do is we could distribute the 3 fourths over here. So we're gonna send the 3 fourths through and multiply by negative 8x first, and that's gonna give us 3 over 4 times negative 8 is going to give us negative 6. So I have negative 6 times x. And then if I do 3 fourths times 20, that's going to give us 15. But we have a positive times a positive, so we're going to get plus 15. All right, the math that I'm doing in my head is I'm just multiplying these numbers together. I'm doing 3 fourths. So let's say I do 3 fourths times 20 in my head. The math that I'm doing here is I'm doing 20 divided by 4 is 5 and then five times three is equal to 15. Okay, so that's where I'm getting that 15 from. But if I wanna do this in the calculator, I could just do parentheses three over four, and then I close the parentheses, and then I'm gonna multiply by 20. So I'm just gonna put 20 in parentheses like this. Remember, parentheses in math means multiply. So I just press enter, and I get this. I could also just do three divided by four first to get three fourths is 0 0.75, and if I multiply that by 20, so I just write times 20, that's also going to give me 15. So our numbers so far are looking good. And now we'll distribute the negative eight. So negative eight times negative x is positive eight x. Remember, a negative times a negative is a positive. And then I have negative eight times negative three is positive 24. So this so far looks good. Negative six x plus 15 equals eight x plus 24. There is no mistake yet. But now from step one to step two, it looks like this student is moving the x terms to one side of the equation. They're moving things to the right. But if I want to move things to the right, I have to do plus 6x to both sides. Okay, the opposite of negative 6x would be positive 6x. Okay, so I'm just going to do plus 6x on both sides. And notice on the left side, these terms cancel. And we have 15 equals 8x plus 6x is 14x. And we're going to have plus 24. And there's the mistake. You could see here that this student got 2x plus 24. So what they did is they saw that minus 6x, and they probably just did 8x minus 6x is 2x like this. All right, but we just have to be very, very careful here. All right, that's where the mistake is in step two. So now we just go ahead and solve this. Our goal here is to solve for x. So we're going to do minus 24 on both sides. Okay, so 15 minus 24 that's gonna give us, we're gonna have negative nine. And this is equal to 14x. So now to solve for x, just divide both sides by 14. And this tells us here that x is equal to, and we have negative nine over 14. But now we just have to explain here, where did the student make the error? And what is the correct value of x? Okay, or I'm sorry, not where, what error did the student make? So we have to describe the error that the student made we're explaining our answer. So just looking at this, what did the student do wrong? They, instead of doing plus 6x and doing 8x plus 6x is 14, the student by mistake did 8x minus 6x and got 2x. So we just record our x value here. Our correct x value here is x equals negative 9 over 14. Question 45, we have two functions are represented below. We have function a and function b. And we want to know what is the difference in the rate of change between function a and function b. And we have to be sure to include the rate of change 
of each function in our answer. Okay, so for this question, it helps to know two ways of finding slope. So if I have a line in the form y equals mx plus b, my equation is in slope intercept form, then the slope is the coefficient of x and the b value is the y intercept. So just looking at function a, I could see that the slope of function a is 35. That is the coefficient of x. And I'm able to just read off the coefficient because we're in the form y equals mx plus b. Now, technically here, our b value is zero, and we don't actually have to write plus zero at the end. If there's no number written there, it's implied to be plus zero. So here, the y-intercept is not important. What is important is the slope because the slope is the rate of change of a line, okay? So this, our slope here is equal to 35. Now, one thing we could also say is that the slope of a line we could find by using the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I could also just count the rise over the run, but if you would rather use the slope formula, then the slope formula is just very reliable. So let's say I take these two points here. I take the point 0, 0, and then the next point here, I'm going to say over here, we're going to use this point. We're going to have 1 is our x, and the y coordinate is at 50. So if I want to find the slope of function b, or the rate of change of function b, I'm going to do, I'll call this x1, y1, and this point we'll call x2, y2. And now I just plug into the slope formula. We're going to have 50 minus 0, that's y2 minus y1, divided by x2 minus x1 is going to give us 1 minus 0. And if I do 50 divided by 1, that's just going to give us 50. Okay, so now that we have the rate of change of function b, and we have the rate of change of function a, we could find the difference between the two. And the difference between the two, we just have to subtract. 50 minus 35 is equal to 15. But now we just have to explain our answer. Question 46, at the beach, a child uses a container in the shape of a cylinder to build a sandcastle, and the child completely fills the container with sand, and the container has a height of 10 inches and a diameter of 12 inches, and then we have that there are 231 cubic inches in one gallon of sand, and we want to know what is the approximate volume of sand in gallons in the container, and we have to round our answer to the nearest gallon. So for this question, what I'm imagining here is we have some cylinder. So I'm just going to draw out a cylinder. And with this cylinder here, they gave us the dimensions. They told us that the height of the cylinder is 10 inches. Okay, so this cylinder here is 10 inches. And they told us the diameter is 12 inches. Okay, so that's the space going all the way across like this. This is 12 inches. And if we want to find the volume of a cylinder, the volume of a cylinder, we could go to the reference page is pi r squared times h, okay? So this formula is on the reference page. Now, one thing we have to be very careful with is that we need to plug the radius into this formula. So if we plug in 12, <coughs> a very dangerous bear trap, okay? We have to be mindful here that 12 inches is the diameter of the cylinder. We have to find the radius, and to get the radius, we just take the diameter and we divide it by two, okay? So we have 12 inches, we divide by two and we're going to get six inches. Okay, so the radius of this cylinder is six inches. That's the distance from the center here to one end like this. So the radius is six inches. So now what I could do is I could plug in. We have pi times the radius is six inches and we are squaring it. And then we're going to multiply by the height, which is 10 inches. Okay, and for this part here, we can just use the calculator. If I want to simplify a little bit just to make this a little bit nicer, I have six times six is 36. And if I do 36 times 10, that's 360. So I have 360 times pi. And then I have inches times inches is square inches. And then inches squared times inches is inches to the third power or cubic inches, okay? Or you could just write your units at the end that this is cubic inches. But now eventually we are going to plug this into the calculator. But our goal here is to find the volume in gallons and they told us that there are 231 cubic inches for every one gallon of sand, okay? So this corresponds to one gallon 
of sand. So here, and I'll leave out the of sand. I'm just going to say 231 cubic inches for every one gallon. And this is referring to sand. So now what we have is if this is the volume of the container and this is the units here are cubic inches, we want to talk about how many gallons of sand is that. Well, what we could do is we take 360 pi. So we have 360 pi and the units here are cubic inches. And we want to convert this to gallons. I'm going to multiply by one gallon for every 231 cubic inches. Okay, so if you just know to divide 360 pi by 231 and write gallons at the end, then great. But I personally like to write the units out like this so that we could see the units actually cancel. You know, a lot of students will mix these ideas up. Like, let's say if I told you all right now, and this is true, I am six feet tall. And I ask you, how many inches tall am I? Some people might just say, oh, do times 12 and you're 72 inches. But if I do six feet times 12, I'm going to get 72 feet not 72 inches. So what I do is I use the fact that there are 12 inches in one foot. 12 inches in one foot are equal in measure. So when I write times 12 inches over one foot, I have a fraction where the top and bottom are equal. And this fraction then would be equal to one. So I'm really just multiplying six feet by one. And that doesn't change the value. It's just going to change the representation. But notice that feet over feet cancels and we get 72 inches. Okay. So that's one way to go forward with this. You could also set up a proportion here to solve, but what we just did over here is going to be fine. So now what we're going to say is we're going to have 360 pi divided by 231 and the units here are going to be gallons. So now we could just type in the calculator. We have 360. I'm going to put in parentheses and the pi I'm going to press second and this up arrow here. So this is what we could use for pi. And now we're going to divide. So I'm going to close the parentheses here and we're going to divide by 231. And now this is the value that we're getting. So now we'll just record this result. We have the volume is roughly equal to because this does get chopped in the calculator. We have 4.89 and then we have 5988 and we have 551 gallons. And we, in the beginning of the question, we're told to round to the nearest gallon. So we look at the ones place here and to the right is an eight. So we're going to round this up to five gallons. So we could say about five gallons. Okay. So that is our solution to question 46. Question 47, we have to solve this equation over here and we could start this by using the distributive property. So I'm going to send the negative one half through the parentheses like this. And we could start this off by saying 3.2 and then we have negative one half times X is negative one half X. And then we're doing negative half times four. A negative times a positive is negative. And if I do half of four, half of four is two. And now this is equal to, on the right side, we have 4.8x and we have plus two. And then we have minus 5.2x. So then the next thing that jumps out at me is that we should combine like terms. So we could do 3.2 minus two. And 3.2 minus two is going to give us 1.2. And then we have minus one half X. And this is equal to on the right side, we can combine like terms. We have 4.8 X minus 5.2 X. And that's going to give us negative 0.4 X. Okay. So I have negative 0.4 X. And then I just have my plus two going over here like this. So this, we can use a calculator, but otherwise what I'm thinking of in my head when I do this mental math is I'm doing 48 minus 52. Okay, so I'm doing 48 minus 52. I know that 52 minus 48 is four. So I just throw a negative in front because I'm subtracting a bigger number from a smaller number. Okay, so that's how I know it's coming out negative. And now from here, I notice that we have X's on opposite sides of the equation. So our goal here should be to get all the X's on one side and the constant terms on the other. So from here, what we could do is we could add one half X to both sides. So I'm going to go plus one half and I just tack on the X and I'm going to do that on this side as well. But now the next thing that I'm looking at is that our X terms are not in the same form. Notice that on this expression here, we have a decimal. And for this expression, we have a fraction. So what we could do is we could turn one half X into a decimal. I could say 0.5 X since 0.5 is equal to a half. And now I have 0.5 X minus 0.4 X. And then I have plus two. 
So now we just combine like terms. We have 1.2 equals 0.5x minus 0.4x. I'm doing 0.5 minus 0.4 is 0.1. So I have 0.1x and then plus 2. And now I'll do minus 2 on both sides to get the constant terms together. And just know for a question like this, if you have to do any of the arithmetic in the calculator, there's no shame in doing this, especially for a big test. You could just check 1.2 minus 2 and you'll get negative 0.8. Okay, so once again, any of this arithmetic that I did above, you can use a calculator for. So we have now on the right side, we're just left with 0.1x. So now I'm going to divide both sides by 0.1 to get x by itself. And this, once again, we can just use a calculator. But this, what I'm imagining in my head is I'm just imagining that we're doing negative 8 divided by 1. Okay, so I'm just seeing negative 8 divided by 1, which is negative 8. And that is our value of x. Okay, so x equals negative 8. So we could just write our answer here. That is our solution to question 47. Question 48, our last question. We have three equations are listed below, and we have to identify a linear and a nonlinear equation from the list. And we have to state a reason why each equation that we identified is linear or nonlinear. So a linear equation, what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a linear equation is something in the form of y equals mx plus b. Okay, so just looking at these equations here, I could see that the last two equations are linear. If I rewrite this equation in the form negative 3x plus 2, you could see that it exactly matches the form mx plus b. And then if I rewrite this equation as 1 third x plus 2, this one here is also in the form y equals mx plus b. So for this one, I could just pick either one of those two. And the reason that we know it's linear, so let's say we pick the last one. So we pick y equals 2 minus 3x. How do we know that this equation is linear? It is in the form of y equals mx plus b. Okay, the highest power of x here, or the only x term here is x to the first. So that's how we know we have a linear equation. Now, because I mentioned that the last two equations are linear, that makes this equation here nonlinear. But how do we know that this one is nonlinear? What we could do is we could distribute the x all the way through. So if I do x times 3x, that's going to give us 3x squared. And if I do x times 2, that's going to give us 2x. So just looking at this equation here, you could see how it's different. It's not in the form mx plus b. It's in this form over here where we have the highest power of x is x to the second power, okay? So this is actually a quadratic equation. A quadratic equation, if I wanna write it over here, is in a different form. A quadratic equation is in the form of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, okay? So that's how we know we have a quadratic equation here. The highest power of x is x to the second, and it's in this form. So that is our nonlinear equation. We could say that y equals x times 3x plus 2 is our nonlinear equation. And how do we know? Because this is a quadratic equation. So here is our solution to question 48.